episode of The Heart Speaks. I spoke with an awesome author and curator, an all-around great person, Chloe Muvuezo, who wrote an incredible book called Life, I Swear. This book is a collection and curation of essays from Black women all over the diaspora. And they speak about their lives. They speak about their experiences with hardship and heartbreak and trauma, but also resiliency, self-actualization, individualization, all the things that bring us closer to ourselves and to others. In this episode, we talk about the art of relationship as a practice, as a skill set, as something that has to be developed so that we can enrich our lives and actually be stronger with ourselves and with one another. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you share it with your family and friends. I certainly will. And overall, I hope you enjoy. Have a wonderful, wonderful week, and I'll see you next time. Well, welcome, Chloe Luvuezo, to the Heart Speaks podcast. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you. you for having me. Yeah, of course. You just recently published a book called Life I Swear and it's a beautiful collection and curation of stories of black women from all over the diaspora. I read it over Thanksgiving weekend Mm -hmm. or week rather uh, and I really enjoyed it especially while I was home back home in New Orleans. So I'd want to start out by just asking you what inspired you to create this book and to bring all these women together and inspire them to share their stories. Yeah, thank you, Chloe, um, for having me. Um, I'm, I love your work, so it's, it's a treat to be able to spend time with you and chat today. This book, um, I'm glad that you, you read it while you had time and you were, while you were relaxed because it feels very much like a pouring of, um, at least speaking on behalf of my own stories, just a pouring of my heart onto the pages. So mm. it it's when I when I thought about how people would consume it, I wanted them to take their time with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I set out to do this book more. So really, I know I needed to use writing as a tool to process my own stories um, and some of my own experiences throughout my life. That you know, I think. For some of them, I had thought, you know, resilience is just moving on. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes. I, I wanted to really, in the spirit of taking taking our time with things, I wanted to, I finally had a window where I had an opportunity to take my time in returning back to some of the stories that and experiences that I had kind of rushed my what I thought was healing through just because I was able to pivot and to, you know, get back on my feet, but really take my time in understanding myself better currently by understanding kind of the dominoes effects of many of my past experiences and their consequences. It kind of all culminated in this moment in um, 2019, where it felt like if I didn't tackle both the heaviness of that particular year, but also of, you know, years prior that I wouldn't be really growing and um, expanding myself. And I wouldn't be able to get on the other side of this healing journey. Not that it's ever done, but I needed to go through it and not around it um, so that I could feel a little lighter about my own stories. And then I just welcomed other women to do the same. Um, I think it was important for me to be the first one to, to put my stories out there Mm -hmm. and, you know, just be able to allow them to trust me as I'm holding their own, their stories as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But it just felt like, we're at the time that was prior to that was like 2019 early 2020 when I started to ask other women it it felt like you know we we needed a safe space Mm -hmm. to pour our our truest rawest ugliest most beautiful selves into 
um, without judgment or um, presumption. So that was the process really for myself and bringing this collection together. That's so interesting. I'm curious because there, there can be a difference between working through your own story privately, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. even privately with others, but still privately mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and sharing it with the world. So I'm curious what gave you the confidence, quite frankly, to be that vulnerable, to be as vulnerable as you were in the book publicly. Mm-hmm. That's a really good question because I think confidence was not the word of the hour as I was writing these <laughs> stories. <laughs> yes. Um, it was just honesty was, you know, and however honesty landed, whether it landed vul- in like a space of vulnerability, a space of being brave, um, I just knew that I needed to be honest in my storytelling. I hadn't thought that it would be published with a big five publisher. Mm-hmm. I thought that I, and, and honestly, I was content with the idea of just publishing a couple copies. And, <laughs> and um, you know, I, I definitely thought that, that self-publishing was going to be the route in small batches. Um, but what gave me the confidence was I hired a book coach and the, the coaching wasn't to like coach me into putting this, necessarily into the world as as um prevalently as it is now Mm -hmm. but it was just hold me accountable to actually writing these stories I had kind of written bits and pieces and um stories I had outgrown and know I knew I needed to revisit Mm -hmm. and so I wanted her to help me bring them all together, organize them, be thoughtful about them and just hold me accountable to finishing something that I set out to do. And what's interesting is that in our first call with her, she had actually experienced very similar Mm. um, things in her own life. And so I think immediately I trusted her Mm -hmm. Um, in the middle of working with her. She was like, I want to be a literary agent and will you be my first client? And I was like, I don't don't know anything about the publishing world. I hadn't even done research about the publishing world. I was just committed to writing it, printing it, whether that was with a paperclip and it being on my shelf or printing it in like a small batch. And she was like, no, we're going to like, let me be your champion because these stories deserve to be yours and all of the other women's deserve to be, um, you know, more accessible. Um, so let's, let's go for a bigger publisher. And, and, you know, when I first started the project, these serve the the process of writing these stories that was in service of myself and the wounds that I had personally, but she really convinced me that they could actually be in collectively, you know, in service of other women as well. Mm -hmm. I trusted her because we had overlapping experiences, um, particularly around um, divorce and pregnancy loss. And so just her creating that safe space for me and making a case that other women could benefit from it too. I just, me also not knowing anything about the publishing process or world. I didn't even shop around. I was just, I let it be her baby as much as it was mine because she was there from the beginning, but it, it definitely did take the coaching that I hired her to do um, ended up being a different kind of coaching to, to gain that confidence, to put it out into the world. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. (laughs) So obviously, you know, this book contains a lot of heartbreak and, sorrow, but also, uh, I would say, reflections on resilience and overcoming uh, traumas and, mm-hmm. um, and really deeply, um, deeply held wounds. And one of the things, and we'll get into some of the details a little bit later, but one of the things that I found fascinating about this, this book is that it's, it seemed to be that it's fundamentally about the art of relationship, which mm-hmm. is something that we're not really taught how to do. Um, there's no class that we go to on how to be in relationship and the, mm. this idea of relatedness as a skill 
and as an mm-hmm. act uh, or as a practice rather. Um, so I'm wondering, did you intend for this for this curation to be that, or did it just sort of emerge? Mm-hmm. Because that that seems to be a common theme mm-hmm. throughout all of the different um, all of the different entries that I saw. These women are learning how to relate and practicing mm-hmm. how to relate both to themselves and to the people in their world and the world around them. And again, that's something that we're not taught how to do. And it really is a practice right. and a skill that has to be developed over time. Mm, that is such a good synopsis. The art of relationship. I had to write that down. Mm-hmm. Um, no, that was not um, by design. Um, mm-hmm. Though I do believe that, you know, one thing that was by design was relationship with ourselves, Mm -hmm. Um, understanding ourselves, you know, pouring into ourselves, nurturing ourselves um, gently and tenderly, um, but honestly as well. I think relationship with ourselves, I think that, you know, for me and I can pinpoint um, some of the other essayists as well, mm-hmm. we learn our, we, we learn ourselves better and then learn how to take care of ourselves better um, through our relationships with others. Mm-hmm. They teach us um, kind of their, their mirrors to how are we, um, you know, expensing our energy Mm-hmm. Um, how are we reacting when our triggers are kind of provoked? Yeah, um, yeah. And so I think that relationships with other people are are almost classrooms mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. how we should have um, a deeper and better, healthier relationship with ourselves. But I think the vice versa applies as well. You yeah, know, yeah. when we are um, still, when we are, you know, in this self-reflective, self-examining, um, really embedded in that, we're able to, to learn ourselves, our needs, our desires, our um, what we really long for from connection. And then we can build relationships accordingly. Mm-hmm. I think hopefully, I think both of them play into relationships with ourselves and, and others. Um, one informs the other and vice versa. Um, but I hadn't thought about it like that. But I do think, you know, in in our life experiences, there's so much to discover and explore on our own in solitude. Mm-hmm. Um, but we really learn um, where our triggers are and how we light up mm-hmm. when we're around other people as well. So, of course... Other people are characters in our, our life stories. Yeah, I, it's so funny because, you know, I was at home when I was reading this book and I was with my parents and I began to notice certain triggers I have with my mom. My mother and I don't have, we don't share the same, let's say, political views. And anytime I would go back home, I would notice well, actually, I didn't notice. This was the issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would be triggered. My ego would be triggered mm-hmm. by her lack of agreement with me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been doing some self-study, but I think reading your book was also part of this. I learned last time I went home um, that what I was seeking was validation from my mother. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and I was defining validation as agreeing with me on (laughs) X, Mm -hmm. Y, and Z, Mm -hmm. and instead of, and I was confusing the practice and the act of relationship and relating and relatedness with trying to control the outcome and trying to essentially um, possess the, uh, possess my mom almost and like Mm -hmm. control Mm -hmm. her and like um, make her who I hoped she could be instead of who she is. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> so I'm wondering, like, if that resonates with you, how that resonates with you, you know, what, what thoughts come up for you when you hear that? Oh, my gosh. I completely understand. I, I completely relate to that as it relates to um, my mother as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, and I didn't, 
grow up with my mother um, very much. I was with her until I was about 10 and then lived with other, a lot of other families, several other families. Mm-hmm. Um, we've always had since then a long distance relationship. And then now as in adulthood, we live five minutes away wow. where before we lived <laughs> continents and oceans away yeah. Um, yeah. or hours away. And so now it's, I relate to that because now it's our opportunity to to build, you know, intimacy and in a way that we hadn't before when we were a phone call away and not a drive away. Mm -hmm. But I find myself wanting to use it. And I think I'm growing out of this, maturing out of this, but I want her to mother me now. I wanted her to mother me. (laughs) And she just returned. um, She just returned from West Africa in 2014. Mm -hmm. So it's actually been, well, six, seven years now, but the earlier part of these last six, seven years, I've wanted her to mother me be, to catch up for, mm-hmm. you know, what we missed. And then I had to remind myself, um, you know, I'm an adult, she's an adult <laughs> and she has autonomy to be her own individual. I think, you know, as it relates to that triggering that you were describing it's, and this shows up in other kinds of relationships as well. It's mm-hmm. I, want you to answer the way I know will bring me ease. Um, Even if that means compromising the truth um, of how you really feel or your perspective. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's so self-serving. And so we, we kind of have to zoom out a little bit um, and, and just recognize the autonomy each of us, each of us have. I was reading um, I, I mentioned um, before we got started, I was reading um, a little bit about your story yeah. and, <laughs> and how one of your kind of epiphanies was um, you realizing, or so, I, I think it was one of your mentors, um, mm, professors yeah. Yeah, saying, yeah, you know, so. we're missing the point if we think that the, the objective of these conversations um, two people with opposite perspectives coming together need to agree. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's really about the understanding. Um, and, and to me, it's, and I, I think of that in terms of the book as well. Um, mm-hmm. One of the, the contributors calls it, you know, storytelling an archive of understanding mm-hmm. and really being able to like cement who we are through how we understand each other. But knowing that the, the, that's to me, the bottom line, the bottom line is not in convincing or converting you to my ways. Sure. It's yeah. let me understand you. Um, so that, and you understand me and hopefully we shift our perspectives, mm-hmm. but if there's any enlightenment that comes out of it, it doesn't necessarily have to be limited to um, being agreeable. The enlightenment sure. could come out of realizing how different we are and that being a mirror to me and then me thinking about my own ways or my own insights differently um, or feeling more confident um, but not letting ego Mm. drive that confidence um, letting wisdom drive it that's hard (laughs) (laughs) yes Um, because ego is its like own person at the party (laughs) For sure. And it's also hard, I think, with close relationships, whether it's a parent, whether it's a romantic partner. Um, I want to talk about something you bring up in the section entitled Unhealed Wounds, where you talk about this guy that you dated named Guy. Uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, And you talk about how he exploited your insecurities. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I love this line that you have. You say, uh, not everyone in our lives is on divine assignment. Some people come to slay your spirit. And I have mm-hmm. to say that when I read that, I was like, whoo, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it, it took me, it took me back a bit. Um, yeah. So my question for you is, I guess, what advice can you give, especially to young women who, who, may not be who may be oblivious to the signs may may not be able to tell what those signs are when they're entering into 
a relationship or a situation where their partner is essentially um, feeding off of, you know, in a sort of parasitic way, as opposed to relationship and in that relational giving and receiving, giving and receiving. Mm-hmm. Kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that was one of the um, the essays that I I really needed to take my time with because mm-hmm. I think sometimes we experience tough um, tough parts of our journey like this one and mm-hmm. that re- this relationship and we outgrow them mm-hmm. to the point or we move on like I was talking about earlier we move on so fast and you're like I'm not affected who's affected I'm not affected not me (laughs) it would be weak to be affected right it would be a sign of weakness right right yeah and so in that sense you know skipping over the actual processing and healing of it and now you know that feels several lives ago Mm -hmm. um I've disassociated from the girl, you know, I was between, how old was I, between 22 and 27 in that relationship. Mm -hmm. It feels so long ago. And the work it took to actually like, okay, put myself back in your old shoes and (laughs) walk yourself through the process of what flags did you see that you ignored? Mm. What didn't you see because of your naivete or your your desire to feel loved and to feel a home in someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, What were you chasing? What were you resisting? All of those questions, I think, um, deserve to be top of mind, not just in retrospect, but in the moment. It's obviously hard to do as a young girl. You only know what you know, and you're impressionable, and you want so bad to feel loved. And you've almost written your love story before you've walked it. Um, and so <laughs> that's an issue I find in, in that itself. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. so I think, you know, the biggest question I'd probably ask my then self and then now um, other younger women is what are you holding back? Cause I find that usually when we're in relationship romantic or otherwise with overly dominant characters, mm-hmm. um, there is something that's top of mind that we're not saying or top, or top of heart that we're not saying, we're, we're holding it back either because we don't want to ruffle feathers. Yeah. We don't want to put the truth out there because then we might have to actually deal with it. Yeah. We actually, if it, if it be, then becomes a reality that yeah. we can't undo or unsee or un, um, unknow. And so I think if we're being really honest with ourselves in the moment, in relationships that aren't aligned or on divine assignment. Mm -hmm. um, We have to be honest about what is at the tip of our tongue or what is top of mind that we're not actually letting out on the table. Mm -hmm. I would, I would guess that either it's a hesitancy or a fear or something that is minimizing your voice, not just what aren't you saying, but why aren't you saying it? Mm -hmm. Um, and that is an indicator that it's not truly a safe space where you can sink into, where you can be your authentic self. And how could you live at your highest vibration if you're if you're 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 not provided the environment um, within relationships to be all that you are and all that is um, and share all that that is on your heart or on your mind. And so, I think in dynamics like the one I expl- described in this essay, Unhealed Wounds, um, I would argue that most of us women who enter into them have something that we're holding back in saying or expressing mm-hmm. and asking yourselves, what is that thing? Because sometimes we don't always know. We just know it's it's an itch that we're like, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then why? Why are you mm-hmm. holding it back? It's interesting. I find that there's this um, there, there's this relationship between, you know, uh, wanting to belong, right? Wanting to belong to a relationship or or group, 
um, or collective of some sort and wanting to express yourself, your individuality. And there's always this tension between those two things. But I do wonder within the context of a romantic relationship, and I've certainly had this experience, um, and I wonder if this is uh, more pronounced with women, is because we are such relational beings and because we thrive off of this feeling of, of relatedness, we can sometimes compromise on our own individuality. And we can be so afraid of being alone, right? That we will compromise and put mm -hmm. up with a number of things just so we can stay in, um, I won't call it a relationship because I, I think that, that that word has weight and has to mean something specific, but just so that we can be tethered to someone else. Mm -hmm. And I was reading this book um, called The Way of Woman, which is a beautiful book. I highly recommend mm -hmm. it. Um, the Way of Woman by Helen Luke. And she talks about how, um, she talks about the role of sacrifice in becoming your true self. And you, you have to always sacrifice the thing that means the most to you. And she talked about one of the challenges and the quests, so to speak, that women must encounter is their willingness to sacrifice being with someone else, their willingness to be alone, right? Mm -hmm. um, in order to actually operate on that higher frequency and in operating on that higher frequency, inadvertently or uh, counterintuitive be able to actually attract someone mm -hmm. who's also mm -hmm. on that frequency right. right but the willingness to be alone and the willingness to give up you know being with someone if that person is not the the appropriate person it's something that's really that has to be learned it's like a conclusion one has to arrive at it's also very difficult difficult to arrive at that to yes. arrive at that realization yeah, no, I, I agree. I think I've um, experienced both. <laughs> um, you know, just that it's kind of an arc, I think, of um, when I think about even my romantic um, life. Um, and for sure, I think the theme of my younger, you know, part of my life, mm -hmm. um, certainly, you know, after leaving um, Niger, West Africa, where I spent most of my formative years um, between, I, I came back to the States at, at 14 years old. And between then and literally, you know, mother, when I became a mother, motherhood, yeah. I felt like I was in that, that stage of wanting like deep desire and fulfilling, or deep desire for belonging and mm -hmm. filling it um, with relationships, some mm -hmm. that were meaningful, some that were not, but they, yeah. that void was filled. Um, and it, it, that, that desire for belonging definitely led me into, um, in, into relationships that, you know, are, are no longer existing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, and then it was really in, you know, there was a, a good few years where I sunk into that singledom, which was like the, the most thriving I have been spiritually, um, mentally, emotionally. Um, it's the season where this book was birthed out of. Um, and so I, I definitely think that um, to get to that place, though, where I welcome um, solitude and um, all of it, the ways in which it, it contributes to my wholesomeness, I think to get to that point, I needed, and I think that this is also just, you know, whether it's teenage years or, or, or young adulthood, we kind of have to learn the hard way. You know, we could, we could tell um, young women um, all about, um, you know, the importance of, of being in solitude, but I think it takes being tired and being worn down sometimes, um, being exhausted by, um, by a, a track record of cycles um, that really sometimes aren't as progressive 
aggressive as um, we can be when we're alone. And so however long that takes you, I think that once you get to that place of um, really appreciating the solitude, Mm. um, you're able to create the like rich soil that you need to then plant new things, Mm. you know, new new relationships based um, not on trauma informed kind of past, but on possibility and light and, um, you're, you're in a place where the two of you can almost educate each other along the way versus, um, you know, a, a codependent depleted, um, state, which is why I titled that one essay unhealed wounds. It's when two people who are, who are wounded come together and trying to look to each other to heal their wounds when really, the, the moral of that story, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. the moral of that story was um, to really invest in our own um, healing of our own wounds before we um, create codependent based relationships. Yeah, that seems to me connected to your point about this um, impulse that we sometimes have to fix people. Mm, yes and uh, this is something that I'm... <laughs> I, I I hear you um I hear and see you taking a, d- a deep sigh <laughs> this is something that I um that I uh have to work on for sure for sure mm-hmm. um, but it, it has become um you know while it started off I think as instinctual to that fixer stage. And I think a lot of women just as nurturers and caretakers, we lean into that, particularly before we have children. Um, But it's, it's almost, you know, it's a loving act to tell someone, no, you, you take care of you. And then, you know, we can come back together. um, If it's meant, if it's meant for that, but Mm -hmm. it is loving tough love, but necessary loving act when um, you allow someone to, to learn their lessons on their own and yeah, okay. knowing that we can love them afar. You wrote that um, our worth is not dependent upon our capacity to fix people, but, mm. but it, it, it's, it's simply like as we are. Mm-hmm. That, that really landed for me and that was really profound and I'm learning that I'm learning how to do that right now in my relationships how to be with someone who is experiencing hardship and not try to like oh let me give you the solution to this but just be Mm -hmm. in that hardship and listen to them and and just be as opposed to trying to fix and you know kind of play whack-a-mole almost for sure (laughs) And uh, it's a, it's a very fascinating, it's a very fascinating self-discovery. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in our society where, where I think we're conditioned to, you know, productivity and all these things are, that are part of like the fixer, fixer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we can't afford to be martyrs for everything and everyone, Mm. particularly if we are, (laughs) Um, so willing to compromise ourselves along the way, mm. what do we have left? Mm. You know? it's so so sometimes, yeah. And so sometimes it's not a matter of fixing, but just holding space and then, you know, even leading by example and bringing people along with you on the way, should they choose to, to follow. But, um, yeah, we cannot be martyrs for, for everyone's heartbreak, um and pain yeah also a thing I'm working on um um, do you have a favorite essay from the Mm. the book wow of my own or of other Other, either one yeah oh gosh it's it's so hard I think my favorite essay to write for myself was definitely hues of exposure and I feel like there's also just so much packed in there that with the word count, I couldn't get it all out, but I, I think I could make a, a whole book out of hues of exposure. Um, and that's really about my own upbringing um, and having 
so many um, experiences where I was exposed to so many different communities and cultures and ways of life and perspectives. Um, I got to see how race and privilege and access and citizenship um, and geography, mm. um, color, all have different kind of, they show up differently in different contexts. Yeah. Um, and so that is, can definitely be fleshed out, but it was really yeah. fun um, to really take myself back to the, the senses, the, the sights, the sounds, the things I remembered from growing up in, in sub-Saharan Western, West Africa, um, but I, I definitely didn't put it all on the table. There's more. So that was that was fun. Um, I really enjoyed that because it felt like an homage, homage to um, to my beginnings, even in lieu of not having considered that home to this day in search of home. My favorite. Gosh, there's so many. And. You know, they're, they're, they're all great. And I say that because I know the women behind them and not all the, of them I knew before embarking on this book project, but I grew to, to learn and love them each through this project. Yes. Um, I think one that really stands out for me is um, the one by Gabrielle Williams, The Love Word Journey. Mm -hmm. And she is born and raised in Maryland when she was Spelman, and she up and moved to Brazil, to Bahia, um, after college. Yeah. And so yeah. she experiences um, also race and privilege in different ways. And I think for me, you know, I'm biracial. And so I think that it was also beautiful to see how another woman, a Black American woman, also experienced some of the same um, intricacies of that um, that global life yeah. um, for, in a different way. But she talks about um, in her essay, really Bahia being just this eye opener in how Blackness shows up outside of the U.S., mm -hmm. Um, and that really led to her, her journey as a spiritual healer, um, which mm -hmm. she is now. Um, she does sound healing for me and my son sometimes. Right. And she's, she's, she's awesome. And then just what it was like coming back to the U.S. as a single mother and being, um, you know, coming from a middle class, um, well to do family, educated, but standing in line um, for uh, a government check and yes. what that did again to ego. And yeah. I think there's just so much packed into that, um, that while our, we may not, um, we may, may not resonate with the specific experience. We resonate with that. Like, what if, what if, and this kind of, were kind of the questions that came up when Wakanda came out, yeah. um, Black Panther came out. It's like, what does blacklist live look like outside of these structures? Yeah. Um, I think that's a question we've all asked ourselves. How does ego play into um, stages of our lives that we may not feel incredibly proud of, but there's mm. pride in um, where we do stand. And so I think that, that that story just hit home for me mm. uh, in different ways. And do you think having such a global experience gives you kind of an insider outsider relationship with the world, number one? And number two, do you think, if so, does being an insider outsider give you insight into different spheres of life that someone who may not have had that same experience um, has? Because my experience, my experience has been I am an insider outsider of different cultures from a from a religious perspective, from a spiritual perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can see things, uh, I can see things within cultures and I can see what what's sometimes not being seen from within those cultures, uh, from within mm -hmm. those spiritual cultures. So I'm wondering if you find that you get insights or aha moments that is the, the product of your lived experience uh, of such a globally lived experience. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. I, I think that, and that inside or outside, I love the way you frame that. Um, cause it has felt like I've had, you know, uh, a, a peak, a, not just a peak, but a seat at different tables, yeah. but also, um, felt like a guest at those tables, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's quite literally, um, it's figurative, but it's also literally, you know, having lived, um, within multiple families, they were from, you know, Canada, from Liberia, mm-hmm. um, a black American family a native American family, even within my own family, you know, um, my mother's side, they're white. I was the only, um, person of color in their family on my father's side, um, Congolese. And I'm the only one who's mixed American and, um, has the access of American, that American citizenship grants. And so just literally living with these families, um, and that's my insider and and understanding how they're forming their perspectives on the world and, and what, what they do, what they don't do, um, and why, but then also feeling, very much like an outlier, even between my own families. Mm. Um, I think, you know, each of them provide reference points Mm -hmm. um, for me. And Mm -hmm. I I would say a bit, yeah, they they provide reference points. And I I say that not to avoid saying comparison, um, (laughs) because, (laughs) um, because I understand why communities and cultures are so insular. Um, yes. as a way to preserve or protect. Yeah. Um, and in that sense, you know, feeling like a guest, I can also respect that, you know, yeah. where earlier in my years, it felt like a dab, um, you mm. know, or a, a red line drawn down the sand, you stand over here where we are over here. Now, I think, in my, my adulthood, it's a study, it's a study. It's a, you know, I studied cultural anthropology in in college um, and journalism. And I think just putting my kind of investigative journalism, cultural anthropologist hat on, um, I've grown even in the role of feeling very much like an outsider, an outlier. I've grown such deep respect for the insularity of communities. Um, and that also um, translates a bit to religion as well. Yeah. Um, I grew up in Niger, which was predominantly Muslim country. Mm-hmm. Um, my father's side is Catholic, also believe in voodoo and, and things mm-hmm. like that and medicine yeah. doctors. Um, and then have been, you know, while in the States, um, while I am not of a religion, when I do, um, I do deeply appreciate Baptist um, Christianity. And so it's been interesting having reference points to either gut check, fact check, (laughs) intuition check, um, you know, one against the other. Yeah. So it's interesting as you were saying, as you're talking about coming to uh, coming being able to respect the insularity of Mm -hmm. communities I think that's a very mature um Mm -hmm. (laughs) a mature perspective that a lot of people can't understand just because Mm -hmm. they don't have the same experiences and I it 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 strikes me that that was one of the central questions in Black Panther right I mean Mm -hmm. whether or not we should remain insular we being Wakanda uh, to clarify, mm-hmm. <laughs> but whether or not we should remain insular or, you know, go out into the world and share our knowledge and share yeah. our resources with the world, understanding that both of these have um, pros That's and cons, it. benefits and, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. quandaries. Right. Um, and that will continue to be the case. You know, there, I think uh, from a psychological perspective, when it comes to relating to ourselves, related, relating to the various communities that we navigate, there is no resting place in the sense that there is no, there is no place that we come to where it, it's like everything is resolved, right? Mm-hmm. Where, um, but one of the things I'm learning is that 
I don't even want to necessarily come to a, a, a place of absolute resolution. Right. Right. Because what would Same. that mean? You know, that there would be nothing else to do. There would be, nothing, <laughs> there would be, you know, so it's almost as if it's like a dance. Yeah. Right. And, and, and the objective is to keep the dance going along, even, mm-hmm. even in those, in, in those moments where there's tension or there's pain mm-hmm. or, or there's something uh that you're learning about yourself that you didn't know was there that you have to continue the process yeah absolutely and I think about it as just being constant discoverers Mm. explorers question askers yeah Um, yeah I love the dance it's it's is really allowing one insight to lead you to another Mm. and then that constant peeling back um for sure so Alexandra says something in in her essay um, that's related to this to this sort of riff. She talks about curiosity. She says mm-hmm. um, she says I I tap into my spirituality, which is channeled by curiosity. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing is, people are are deathly afraid of the unknown. Yes. Yes. Um, so. <laughs> so and um, and you can't have an orientation that's rooted in curiosity unless you're willing to to dance with the unknown as opposed to yes. like being afraid of the unknown. So I'm like, do you have any advice or any tips on getting in right relationship with the unknown? Mm. Yeah, I think the unknown actually speaks so much to this like life. I swear, and and how I came up with the title. And yeah, being, please share with us how you yeah, did that, the, the um, you know, the unknown was such a theme, and I I think I speak on behalf of all mid twenty somethings, <laughs> <laughs> every single one. Um, yeah. you know, the unknown was the theme of life in that time, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. and it's I don't I've gotten maybe I've gotten this degree, but maybe I've, you know, I've had a certain level of experience. I don't know how I'm going to apply it. I don't know my value yet to be able to claim, claim space confidently without feeling like imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. yeah. (laughs) I, I, I don't, you know, I can be a planner, but as you get closer to your thirties, realize like, you can't really plan everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and you'd be almost limiting yourselves if you could. Um, and just the unknown ambiguity and like that, like life, I swear, like what, (laughs) what do you have for me? What have you done to me? Where are we going with this thing? Um, called life. Um, it's kind of that sigh, like our moment of reflection, where we're like life, man, I swear. And sometimes we're in awe of, of the things that we we've, we've done or been through. And sometimes we're in awe of the unknown. Like, yeah. and I love, I love, I love the word awe. It's just this wa- wonder, wander. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, you know, ambiguity can be a beautiful thing, mm. but it can only be a beautiful thing if we're not going head to head to it with ego, right? Mm, mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I do think, you know, as it relates to spirituality, which that part of Alex L's um, essay is about, and spirituality kind of being very intertwined with curiosity and discovery mm-hmm. um, and letting that lead you and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about the the objective is to just understand and we understand by asking questions by you know allowing ourselves to 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 dance from one one side of the room to the other um if we are so linear in how we think about either life or spirituality or religion or or um relationships how to navigate them. Um, there is no blueprint, I, th- I believe, for any of those things. But if we, if we pursue them in a very linear path, um, 
we don't get to discover more of ourselves. Right. And that's the, that's the casualty of mm. not being curious. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, have two, I have two more questions for you. The first mm-hmm. question is, well, I just want to draw that last point that you just made to something that you write at the very end of the book, which is, um, it is never too late to form new images of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And um, my, my spirituality has been in, uh, informed lately by Taoism. Mm-hmm. And there's this idea within Taoism that um, that the there there is no image essentially there is no one thing that can that can contain the image of God right? there is no one thing mm-hmm. um, and Taoists often talk about the no thi- the no thingness of God as opposed mm-hmm. to the nothingness of God the no thing yes right? I love that. that and and when i think about that on an individual level and think about the no thingness of human beings right there is no singular one thing that captures who we are or or our essence and that idea really gives me a sense of relief actually in times where i'm dealing with a sticky situation or a painful situation or a sorrowful situation, all of these different feelings are simply just aspects of the no thingness mm-hmm. of what mm-hmm. it means to be human, right? Um, mm-hmm. and, I, and I find that very uh, clarifying and I find that, mm-hmm. I find a similar, a, a similar sound almost in, in, in that last quote that you put in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that. Yeah, how does that resonate with you? Well, one, I'm going to be looking into Taoism when I'm, when yeah. <laughs> on Google when this is over. Yeah. Um, but that resonates with me. And I think that it also speaks to, interesting enough that you said it speaks to the, the ending of the book, but even the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, and that first part of the book is sum, S-U-M, of our parts. Ah. Meaning I am not one thing. Yeah. I am the sum of of everything that I am. I am my memories. I am my parents' stories. Mm. None of these are things, you know, because I think that when we say, where are you from? or Where's where's home to you? It's about the home you grew up in, the street, the, mm. the very tangible place in terms of like pin dropping in geography. It helps us get a sense of, okay, you're from, you know, east side of wherever city yeah. <laughs> I under I understand you I can I can pin you to that one thing I get who you are it makes me easier it makes it easier for me to digest my assumption about you yeah but yeah. I am from many places I'm from many families I'm from um all of the friends that raised me I'm from my memories I'm from my heartbreaks my mm-hmm. breakthroughs the the ironies that have happened in my life the, co- the, the coincidences and the consequences of, of things that I've done, whether good or bad, there's not one thing that defines me. Um, and in that, and also in the spirit of it's never too late to reimagine new, new versions of ourselves, you know, we're fluid. And I, I think of identity in a very holistic way. Yes, it is race, but it is also how you see yourself and that can change experience to experience. Yeah. And I really appreciate the, the no thingness because that is, I think language that I think I needed when I was yeah. younger, when I was trying to fit the, the square that I am into the circles of the world. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that deeply resonates with me. Beautiful. So my last question for you is, do you have any practices? Do you journal? Do you, um, I've been recording my dreams lately. Mm. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any practices that you can share with us to help us in this, you know, self-actualization uh, uh, challenge that we're embarking upon. Mm. All of us together. I love that you record your dreams. I've been doing that too. And I've also been trying to actually realize some of my dreams um and they don't make sense to anyone else who (laughs) didn't have them (laughs) Um, right um 
but yes, I journal. I do. Um, I do try and journal. Mornings are are kind of when my my brain is fresh and clear. So I do try and journal. Um, but I also think that as a writer, and I've had this conversation with some other writers who have felt bad for not writing, 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 writing. Sure. And I have to remind us that part of the writing experience is also living, mm. you know, mm. it's also having the, the engagements, the interactions, whether it's with other people or whether it's with nature um, where we're like tapped into our senses, the smells, the sights, the sounds, all of that is almost like Intel that informs our writing, whether what we actually put on paper or whether it informs our expressiveness because we are so in touch with the, 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 the sensitivities of our exchanges. Um, and so I do try and get outside as mm-hmm. a writing exercise. Like that is part of my writing exercise is to, yeah. you know, get into the nature. Um, I think for me, reading, while I wrote a book, reading has become a luxury that I don't always have with a five-year-old, like, jumping on my face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I love to do, um, I love to do Bikram yoga. That is, Ooh, like, okay. <laughs> it, it's really intense. It's, yeah. like, 100 degrees. You're sweating. You can't think about anything. It, it is, it forces you into meditation. Um Ooh. Whereas meditating without that intensity of, of it's easy for me to get distracted. Um, And so I, I enjoy things that are like all immersive um, in that way. How often do you do, you said Bikram yoga? Yeah, I've, I stopped for a while during the pandemic, you know, hot breathing in closed spaces (laughs) wasn't a good idea. (laughs) Um, But they say that you need to do it to really make it um, like health-wise beneficial about three times a week. Ooh, okay. Okay. I'm going to look into that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to look into that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for yeah. having this conversation with me. I really, really love the, the conversation and I love the book. Is there, any, is there any last thing you'd like to share with our audience that you want them to know about? Um, I would love um, them to to support independent um, bookstores. That's awesome. my biggest takeaway. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Those are the champions of um, of voices, and particularly black owned um, bookstores, um, champions of black authors. So, mm-hmm. I'd um, encourage everyone to to shop there um, before anywhere else. Awesome, beautiful. Well, yeah. thank you, Chloe. Um, I will certainly let you know, or my producer will let you know when this is out. And, yes, thank uh, you, Chloe. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you. Take care. This was so much fun. Yeah, yeah. Have a great rest and of your week. Stay in touch. Okay. Bye. Bye.